he's down he's down with covid so he asked me to uh, to replace him for this uh, third and last session of the spring a series of seminars on AIDS, uh, HIV, which we have organized, uh, which has been also sponsored by the Italian Association for the Study of Modern and Contemporary History. Uh, Cisco, we are immensely lucky to have with us uh, Alan uh, Whiteside, who is someone uh, very well known to all the people who have an interest in the history of, of, of AIDS. Alan was for several years the chair in global health policy at the uh, Balsili School of the University of Waterloo, and he has held uh, a variety of academic and non-academic uh, position. In the 1980s, he worked for the government of Botswana, in 1998, he established the Health, Economic, and HIV AIDS uh, Research Division, where he was the executive uh, director. He's currently a professor emeritus at the University of Kuala Zulu, uh, uh, Natal. In the 1990s, he launched uh, several uh, initiatives, including the AIDS Analysis Africa newsletter, uh, of which he was the editor until 2002. Uh, he uh, was appointed by the UN General Secretary Kofi Annan in 2003 to the Commission for HIV AIDS and Governance in Africa. As I said, he had multiple academic uh, appointments, including visiting professorships uh, in a variety of, uh, of, of schools. And he has published extensively, is the author and editor of many books, including the Oxford Short History of AIDS, which we, at least I, have used uh, to great effect, I have to say, uh, with uh, uh, my students. So without further ado, let me uh, uh, turn uh, uh, the floor uh, to Alan. Thanks so much for accepting our invitation. It's an immense pleasure uh, to welcome you here. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I thought about preparing slides, but it always causes me a great deal of stress because I don't know if they're going to work. And if they don't work, it's a disaster. So what I thought I'd do is just simply talk to you uh, in a not meandering, but a chronological manner, because my brief was to talk about uh, the AIDS epidemic from um, 1981 to, to, to 1996, but I we agreed that we'd extend it to 2000, uh, the period which I'm covering. So that's effectively the first 20 years of the HIV AIDS pandemic. And of course, we're 40 years into it. So there's another 20 years of history to be written. I also love using quotations and talking to this group, it seemed appropriate to reflect on George Orwell who said, he who controls the past controls the future. He who controls the present controls the past. Now, I'm not quite certain that I fully understand what that means, but I do think it's really interesting to write history in as best manner as you can, because there is a real danger of uh, control of various things. Um, and I think we're seeing that so clearly at the moment with something completely different from HIV and AIDS, and that is events in Ukraine, where we can see Putin trying to control the past in order to control the future. And he doesn't control the present, so he can't control the past yet. But it's certainly something which I, I, I think is um, worth thinking about. So what I'm going to do is give you something of an autoethnography, telling you about a time I lived through and really didn't expect uh, to turn out the way in which it did. My experience was of the early decades of the AIDS epidemic. And as I think it's important for me to also set my uh, stand out and tell you that I was born in Kenya and I grew up in Swaziland where I was educated at the very first multiracial school in the region. Uh, it subsequently became a, um, uh, a United World College, and you have a United World College in Italy at Duino up on the, uh, on the Adriatic coast. Um, I left there in 1975 and came to England. And the reason for traveling from Southern Africa to England was that in those days, 
if I'd gone to South Africa, I would have ended up in the army. I would have ended up defending the indefensible. I would have been a conscript. And so I, I, I moved to the UK, did a BA in development studies at UEA in East Anglia, and then an MA in development economics. And then I had a fellowship from the Overseas Development Institute to work as an economist in the Ministry of Finance in Botswana from 1983, uh, from 1980 to 1983. And I current, I do hold a doctorate, which is awarded by the University of Natal in 2003. It's a doctorate of economics. So there I was in Botswana, uh, the country which has the second highest HIV prevalence in the world in the early 1980s. And we had no idea what was heading for us. We had no inkling that there was a pandemic of this, this type and magnitude coming. In fact, it was only in 1983 that I became aware of the AIDS pandemic. Now, obviously the first cases were seen in 1981 uh, in uh, San Francisco. The disease was named, I think in 1982, 83. And in 1983, I, I'm sure it was the same for those of you who remember those early days, um, what we saw was television programs describing the suffering primarily of gay men in various settings. Um, and I would say that these, many of these programs were done with sensitivity, but nonetheless, there was a degree of, of, of almost purient uh, interest in what was going on with these people. Now, I would advise you, and I'm going to give you some uh, references as I give this presentation. If you want to understand the, the nature of the early days of the pandemic, uh, the book to read is called And the Band Played On. And the Band Played On. It's written by an American uh, journalist called Randy Schiltz. That's S-H-I-L-T-S. And it is a brilliantly written book, well worth reading. Uh, it sets out what went on. Uh, this gentleman did, in fact, die of AIDS uh, shortly after he'd finished it. But he sets out how the disease swept through the gay community, primarily in America, but also in many European capitals. What is really significant about this is, of course, that this was happening at a time when the gay community had just won some great freedoms. Uh, but Schultz really does capture the fear of that time and the lack of knowledge and the way people were grasping to understand what was going on. So up until 1980, 80, mid 80s, I actually knew very little about this disease that was, come, was to come to dominate my life. And that was mainly through uh, various press, through the press. But I was interested in it because I had a real interest in, in human capital. So in 1983, I took a couple of posts at the University of Natal in Durban in the, an economic research unit. It was a research post, so it really did allow me to, to work extensively on research. And the key function of what research we did was it had to be paid for. So we would write grants, we would do consultancy work, uh, and we would do whatever research we could and it was something at the time just opening the window because it's a bit warm in my office it was something that we really wanted to do um then if you got the money for it you could do it so we were applying for grants from various people of course it was also a time when south africa was pretty much a pariah in the international academic community as it should have been of the apartheid system so the first project i worked on was on labor migration to south africa and the situation, and some of you again may remember this, is that uh, there was huge migration <clears throat> from the neighboring countries to work of men, to work on the mines, in the industries and on the farms across South Africa. These men were employed on contracts, normally for a year. They were housed in really squalid conditions in single sex hostels and they were not allowed to bring their wives or families. It was exploitation of an extreme variety by capitalism, but also by racist South Africa in the apartheid system. 
1972, it's unbelievable. I think perhaps less unbelievable as we look at the huge numbers of dispossessed people that we've seen in the last decade from Myanmar, from, uh, uh, from UK now. Um, but in 1972, there were 132,000 migrants from South Africa, sorry, from Lesotho. Uh, and that is the extreme example because 22% of the population of Lesotho were migrant workers in South Africa. There were 131,000 from Malawi, 121,000 from Mozambique, 32,000 from Botswana, and 10,000 from Swaziland. These were men traveling across the border to work on contracts in South Africa and live, as I said, in very squalid conditions without their wives or families. So the movement of labor from the periphery to South Africa was happening on an industrial scale, and it was exploitative and discriminatory. Apartheid in South Africa was at, at, at its peak, and people of other races lived oppressed and very often tormented lives. And it, I, I, this is all really important to understand the HIV and AIDS pandemics in South Africa. It's important to remember that these were single men living in difficult, working in difficult conditions in um, mines that were very dangerous. They were poorly paid. In fact, recently I saw something uh, written by Francis Wilson, who died recently, a very, very good economist at uh, the University of Cape Town, who set up the Southern African Labor Research Unit, uh, who noted that wages for miners hadn't increased in 70 years. And if you want to read about this, uh, then I'm going to give you my second reference, which is an excellent book by Kathy Campbell, Kathy Campbell called Letting Them Die, Why HIV and AIDS Prevention Programs Fail, uh, published by James Curry in 2003. So these men had incredibly high levels of sexually transmitted infections. And all around the hostel, hostels and the mining towns, there were brothels, exploited women selling sex for very little money to lonely, isolated, and poorly paid men. It was horrible. And that was the situation that I was looking at when I looked at labor migration in Southern Africa. And as I worked on this project, in the 1980s, I began to realize that these men were at great risk of HIV transmission. They were the ones who would uh, be most likely to experience high levels of HIV infection. And I must admit, uh, it's to my great shame that I didn't at that point think about the wives and families at home in Lesotho or Botswana, Namibia, Mozambique or Malawi. And yet those people were equally going to be adversely affected by this pandemic. So there we saw HIV infection among uh, migrant workers. And if you want to know one of the consequences of this, it was that the Malawian government stopped sending migrant workers when the South African government said you can't send us people who are HIV infected. So the Malawian dependence on the South African mining industry came to an end like that. Suddenly, um, the, the Malawians stopped sending migrant workers to South Africa. Um, there are many books that trace this, and I, I could give you a whole uh, literature um, of this, uh, including a book I wrote in 19 in 2000 with a gentleman called Clem Sunter, which I'll refer to again in a minute. So that's where we were. What um, got a sign on my note uh, thing to say someone's in the waiting room and I'm going to admit if nobody else does. Um, that's where we were in terms of the global pandemic. South Africa, we saw the first AIDS case in 1982. And at this point, I need to say a little bit more about how we collected data. AIDS cases are what we were reporting. 
We didn't know, we knew that there was HIV, which was the cause of AIDS. We knew all that by about 1982, 1983, but we didn't have a way of testing for HIV. So what we were doing is we were recording and reporting AIDS cases. Indeed, in South Africa from 1981 to 1995, AIDS was actually a notifiable disease. If you saw a case of AIDS and you worked in the health system, you had to report it to the National Department of Health. And that meant that we could collect case data, but it was not a, a good thing. And obviously there was a whole issues with the fact that it was being collected by the white racist oppressors up until 1994. Um, in 1995, they decided not to make HIV a notable disease, and they concluded that it was not valuable or helpful to collect this data. Nonetheless, we did collect the data, and what we saw initially was that AIDS was primarily seen in the white homosexual population. Up to 1990, as late as 1990, the AIDS cases were predominantly in the white homosexual population. We did not know what was going on with uh, HIV um, in other, uh, we didn't know what was going on with HIV because we, we just simply uh, did not have um, the tests in order to identify who was HIV positive. So up until 1990, the majority of cases, AIDS cases, were in the white homosexual population. Second came black heterosexuals, and there was a growing number of pediatric cases, pediatric children infected by their, their mothers. So for me, from 1984 to 1990, I watched the numbers climb steadily and slowly. And the disease moved from the white population, the gay white population, into the black heterosexual population. But even so, in 1990, there were still fewer than 500 cases of AIDS um, recorded in South Africa. And of course, the other thing which we need to remember, and I, I know I, I can say this talking to an audience like this, is that this is a terribly political issue. Um, in 1987, I combined my research interests of health and migration and presented my first paper on AIDS and migration at a conference in London at the Barbican Centre. And you can imagine my surprise when at the cocktail party, at the end of the first day, a gentleman from the Chamber of Mines, the, the major mining group in South Africa, walked over to me, he had had a few drinks by that stage, and he said to me, and he looked at me and he said, I, you can't do this, Dr. Whiteside. You can't talk about South Africa in this manner. How dare you talk about how we're treating our black migrant worker miners? And I thought, yeah, well, okay. I was polite and walked away and left him to it. But it was really interesting, that politicization of the epidemic. And another example, which I still vividly remember, is we were reporting the number of AIDS cases to the WHO, who would then collect the data, collate it, and release uh, every so often uh, information on where the AIDS cases were around the world. And this was before the end of a page. And the Zimbabweans released their AIDS case data. And they said, we've got 185 AIDS cases in Zimbabwe. Two days later, the South African government released, this is the apartheid South African government, released their data and they said, we've got 120 AIDS cases. Within 24 hours, the Zimbabwean government had released new data. They went to the WHO and said, oh, we made a mistake. We've actually only got 119 AIDS cases. And that's an example of the politics and the fact, and as I said, he who controls the past controls the future, he who controls the present controls the past. And it wasn't the only example of this politicization of the uh, pandemic. So by 1990, I'd been working on this problem a great deal. And I did a piece of consultancy work for the Development Bank of South Africa. And this is the paper that we produced. 
I'm ashamed of it now, but uh, well, no, I'm not. It was very much of its time. It was a look at what AIDS meant in Southern Africa. It was a position paper. Um, my word, it's naive. Looking at it now, I'm quite shocked by how naive it was. But it was commissioned because the bank was really concerned about what was going on. And it was partly commissioned in response to this. AIDS, count down to doomsday. And this gentleman, a business person, basically he had no qualifications whatsoever to write about AIDS and he had a purient interest in it, uh, wrote and published this book, it's self-published, which is always a, a bad sign, uh, saying AIDS is going to kill all the black people and we better invest in gold. Now, I may be slightly oversimplifying what Keith Edelston said, but there was a degree of glee in what he was suggesting might be happening in South Africa. So, nonetheless, in 1990, it was also the first year in which a proper survey of HIV was undertaken in South Africa. And let me just tell you how it happened. Basically, in order to know what the prevalence rate was in your country, you needed to test a representative sample and work out how many people were HIV infected. So who are you going to collect blood from where you can do what we call an unlinked anonymous survey? So in other words, you've got samples of blood. You can't ever identify them as coming from certain people. It's anonymous and it's unlinked. And the answer is pregnant women, because women who are pregnant uh, are going to have blood taken anyway to do a number of tests. And you can take a small portion of that blood, blood and test for HIV. Anonymous, unlinked testing. It's got to be unlinked because you can offer them nothing. In those days, there was nothing you could offer them. If you found out they were HIV positive, it was just a notation that they were HIV positive. There was nothing you could do for them or their babies. Pregnant uh, women, because they, they obviously are the ones who are having babies. Pregnant, because obviously, and this is a good thing, it's a sexually transmitted disease, and we know that pregnant women have had sex. So we're getting two for one in effect, because you're also going to know something about the prevalence in the male population. So they did a, their survey, and, and let me just digress here. And here's a, a little diagram, which I'm going to show you which shows you the nature of the three waves of the epidemic. We have an HIV A curve, which goes up there. We have an AIDS curve, which goes there. And then we have the impacts of this disease. And that takes time to move. People take time to move from the HIV infection to having AIDS and even longer to fall ill and die. The three curves were really important to understand. Um, but, the problem was in the 1990s, this was inevitable. You knew if people were infected, they would fall ill and they would die. We knew that it was about eight years between infection and illness, and then another two years to death. With that conceptualization, you could begin to plan. But it meant that AIDS was a manifestation of infections that had taken place eight and more years earlier. And in order to understand the challenges and plan properly, you needed to know HIV, the HIV prevalence. So in 1990, the South African government went out and did their first <coughs> zero survey. You might want to write these numbers down. 1990, 0.8% of the women surveyed were infected. By 1994, it's just four years later, and 1994, the year in which, 1990 was the year in which Mandela was released. 1994 was the year in which the first free and fair elections were held and Mandela became the president of South Africa. In that year, 7.6% of the women were infected. An astonishingly large increase. By the time he handed over the presidency to Thabo Mbeki, uh, 
in 1999, the level of HIV prevalence was 22.4. In other words, more than one in five of the women sampled, sorry, more than two in five of the women sampled was infected. Shocking, absolutely shocking. Um, and just a short aside there, there was a lot of awareness about how bad this was, and we were really involved in communication with a lot of people, but we just didn't know what to do. And in about 1998, I was invited to go and talk uh, to the provincial government of KwaZulu-Natal. And some of you may remember that that was a coalition government between the African National Congress and the Nkata Freedom Party. And I went in to talk to our provincial cabinet ministers about HIV and AIDS and to give them the data. And I unthinkingly said, when we look at the ANC data, and as one, everyone from Inkata Freedom Party turned and looked at jo Jacob Zuma and said, what's this ANC data? And I realized what I was doing. I said, no, 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 not African National Congress, antenatal clinic, wrong ANC antenatal clinic, not African National Congress, which was <laughs> really quite, uh, I, you, you say things without thinking about them at, at the, at, uh, sometimes. So there we were, our HIV prevalence went from 0.8% uh, in 1990, up as far as 22%, 22.4% uh, in 1999. Unbelievable. Sorry, that's one in five. That's one in five of the women. The next statistics I'm going to give you is even more shocking. Uh, and we also knew by this time that the majority, the people who were at greatest risk were young women. Young people generally, but young women particularly, was where you were going to see the worst of this pandemic. So the other country in which I had did a lot of work and considered myself deeply embedded in was Swaziland. Now, Here's a little story about data and how as researchers, we need to be so careful about the information we gather. So the first survey they did was in 1992 and they found the prevalence uh, among the antenatal clinic attenders was 30, was sorry, was 3.9%. So in 1992, the prevalence was 3.9%. The next year, and we were by that stage working with them on uh, a project looking at the impact of um, uh, the, the pandemic on the economy, uh, we sat in the Ministry of Health and we waited for the, the results of the 1993 study. And eventually they were made available to us and the people doing the study said, well, look, the prevalence we've got now is 20%. And we looked at them and we said this, well, we looked at each other, actually. It wasn't just us looking at them. We all looked at each other and said, this is impossible. You can't go from 3.9% to 20% in a year. Not unless everybody is having sex with everybody else all the time. And we know that isn't happening because look around the room. None of us are doing anything we shouldn't be doing. So... We said to them, OK, so we've got a problem because we've got irreconcilable data and you can't really do an extrapolation from just one point. But, well, we can. Which one shall we use? And they said to us, well, you need to use the latest data because we've gone out and we've retested every sample. So we went with it. The following year, the prevalence data that came back was 16 percent. So in other words, the data we'd used from 1993 was rogue data. So the crazy thing is that the results we did with the, got from our modeling with that rogue data turned out to be the results that we got with the pandemic when we revisited it in uh, uh, some years later. So I'm just going to hold this up for you. As you can see, it should have gone 3.9 uh, 
3.9 or 4%, 8%, 16. Instead, it went 3.9, 20, 16. And that's the danger of working with data because you never know what you're going to get. And you have to be so very, very careful. Now, why did it happen? None of us knew. But then a few years later, I was talking to a, a Zambian colleague and I was telling him the story of the rogue data we had in Swaziland. And he said, oh, the 1993 data. Yeah, we threw away those tests. It was absolutely crap. There was something wrong with the test kits. And we didn't know. We didn't know. As I said, the irony is that it actually did work out to be uh, just as bad as we thought it was. So 1991, I came to the UK and spent a sabbatical year at the University of East Anglia. <clears throat> and that was quite useful because my colleague, Tony Barnett, had been working with his colleagues on AIDS and agriculture in um, Uganda. And over the next 14 years, I worked very, very closely with Tony Barnett. Uh, you will have seen this, uh, AIDS in the 21st century. In fact, I was very embarrassed. I was went, one of the things I'm doing as a, um, uh, a recently retired person is trying to find things to, uh, that I want to do that will contribute to the community. And uh, I've joined up as a volunteer with our local credit union, which is a very fascinating thing because in African terms, we would call it a stock bell. I think in Latin America, they call it a money go round. It's not quite as simple as that. It's highly regulated. But I walked into the meeting and somebody was introduced to me and I said, oh, you wrote that book, AIDS of the 21st Century, which was, was uh, very funny um, and quite complimentary that people still remember it. So what we did, and this is uh, something which I, I, as an academic, I'm quite proud of. We ran these courses, planning for AIDS. We ran them all over the world. We ran them for 14 years. We brought experts in to talk on a range of things, things that we wanted to know about. AIDS and agriculture, AIDS in the private sector, how to model the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. AIDS and virology. And by the end of that, we trained probably over 500 people all over the world. We'd run them in Ukraine, India, Nepal, Malaysia, South Africa, and the Philippines. And we were talking uh, at the end of one of them. And we said, you know, what we need to do is to combine everything we've done into a book. And this was the book, AIDS in the 21st Century. The other thing that really worked for us, and I, I speak to fellow academics here, is getting somebody to fund you to write it. We actually got a small amount of money from a, um, a, a, a foundation to write this book. And as an economist, nothing focuses my mind more than being paid to do something. Not necessarily because there's a lot of money, because I feel, but because I feel there's a contract and a moral obligation. If you give me money, I have to do it. Otherwise I have to give you the money back. So that's how that book came to be written. And uh, it really was a very, very important uh, piece of work for us and um, had one of those really critical issues, ideas in it that as an ad academic, I feel I've contributed to the global community. And that was the idea of the what we call the Jaipur paradigm, which was about social cohesion and wealth as determinants of how an epidemic would look in a country. Um, I, you've already heard about my publication, AIDS Analysis Africa, <clears throat> which was uh, great fun and allowed us to write some really interesting uh, pieces uh, as a result. So that's what I was doing, but what was going on in the wider world, in the history of the pandemic? I think at that point, there was still a huge amount of stigma but it was clear that this wasn't going to be a global issue, not in the way COVID is. Although I'm not even sure that COVID should be a global issue in the way that it is, but that's something we could talk about when I finished the presentation. It was clear that it was going to be focused in particular areas and among particular groups. And in the West, it was predominantly among the heterosexual men and intravenous drug users. There obviously had been a serious outbreak 
among hemophiliac men, uh, but by uh, the 1990s, it was evident that this was going to be a very restrained pandemic and it wasn't going to affect the majority of people. And there are good reasons to do with that, with, uh, for that to do with uh, sexual behaviors, physiology, um, underlying uh, health, et cetera, et cetera. There was a pandemic in parts of Asia, and the, and the key example here is, is Thailand. And that was identified as being driven by the sex industry and the response of the government, a, a gentleman called Michai Verevadia, was to introduce a 100% condom campaign in the brothels. The ties required all commercial sex establishments to use, uh, use condoms. And if a person went to a health facility with an STI, sexually transmitted infection, and it was traced back to a brothel, that place was closed down. So Thailand's response to the pandemic, which was driven to a large extent by the commercial sex industry, was phenomenal and it shut that pandemic down. Now, of course, in Africa, it was a different story. Most African leaders didn't even want to admit the existence of the disease. There were exceptions, um, Uganda and Senegal. And the story from Uganda, and this is true, is that when Museveni took over the country, conquered the country in 1986, he sent a number of his guerrilla fighters, his, his officers, for further training in Cuba. They were tested for HIV in Cuba, and a number were found to be infected. And the story is, and I have no reason to disbelieve this, that Museveni was taken aside by Castro at one of the meetings that they had and told that he had a problem in his army. And that resulted in an openness and immediate aid, AIDS prevention programs. Now, because there wasn't a lot of HIV testing or STI treatments, so the mobilization that they launched included the slogans, uh, zero grazing, or the ABC campaign, abstain, be faithful and condomize. In other words, your first choice is not to have sex, the second choice is to be faithful, and your third choice is to condomize. And that did succeed in bringing prevalence rates down. Other slogans, zero grazing, love carefully, etc., etc. In Senegal, there was just an incredible openness about sexual behaviors, uh, same intervention in the uh, commercial sex work areas, etc. So that was the global community. And I think um, you will see, uh, if you look at the history of this, a group of people in the West, primarily doctors who medicalized the epidemic, but this could never work in Africa. And we had to bring in uh, many other interventions to try and deal with it. My work was becoming multi-sectoral and I was doing some really interesting work for a range of people. For example, we did a study for the Town and Regional Planning Commission in the province, looking at the need for housing and how the population was changing and who needed space. And we looked at whether or not the orphans that we were seeing in increasing numbers would need special uh, care and treatment. And there was a question of how much cemetery space did we need? Um, obviously, you only need one space once, but there was a question of whether or not the demand was clustering uh, ahead of time. Um, we did a piece of work for the private, we did a lot of work for the private sector. The one example which I found absolutely fascinating was the diamond company in Botswana, Debswana. Uh, we, what we did for them was an institutional audit. What happened, and I can say this now because it's a long time ago, is the diamond company thought they were doing a really great job with HIV prevention. They thought, this is not a problem for us. And they then suddenly discovered high levels of HIV prevalence in their, in their workforce and large numbers of people going off sick. And they did a survey uh, to look at it and they were shocked because the HIV prevalence in their workforce was exactly the same as it was in the community around. And that was extremely high. 
And why were they surprised by that? I don't know. But they asked us to come and do an institutional audit and look at where they were vulnerable. And that was really, really interesting. Who is the most important person in the workforce in a diamond company? Not the managing director. It's not the laborers. In actual fact, it turned out to be the people who drove, drove those super large trucks that went into the pit, collected the, uh, the earth, brought it out to the plant. They had eight of those trucks. They had 16 drivers. If four of those drivers died, and it took an awful lot of training to, to uh, bring them up to speed, um, then you had a problem. You had a bottleneck in your production process. And that was really, really interesting, trying to identify the bottlenecks in the production process. And it turns out so often to not be the people who you think it is. The managing director can be away for a few days. But if the chap who's got the key to open the gate for the factory doesn't turn up for work, then nothing can happen. So it was a really interesting develop, uh, interesting time developing the concept of who your key skills were and where your, um, your production processes uh, ground to halt. On the same subject, I think we had a really fascinating, um, now where did I put that book? Uh, we had a really fascinating time trying to develop uh, material for the international development community. And um, what I did for the European Union, I'm reaching up to get this. And this is something which any of you who do consultancy for the, uh, do consultancy might want to think about. I went to the European Union offices in Brussels. I said, you need to take HIV and AIDS into account. I walked around the offices and everybody agreed. I said, what we need to do is develop a manual for you. And then I looked around those offices and looked at the piles of paper and the number of manuals they had. And I thought, no, no, the last thing they need is more manuals. So what we did is we developed a toolkit and it basically set out what you could do, uh, an introduction, which everybody should look at. And then there were various sections, rural development, uh, HIV and consultants terms of reference, a sectoral checklist. And this was the answer I came up with something simple and easy to use. Um, the D World Bank, on the other hand, uh, set out a manual called Turning Bureaucrats into Warriors. And I, when I first saw it, laughed heartily and rudely and said, if you've got a manual, that'll turn warriors into bureaucrats, not the other way around. And they eventually saw the point of that. So anyway, coming back, um, what was going on in the world? Well, the international agencies didn't know how quite how to deal with it. We were totally let down by the WHO, um, who just couldn't deal with it. The UNAIDS, uh, the global program on AIDS at the WHO uh, got no support from the then director general. And eventually uh, Jonathan Mann just walked out in disgust. And that's the reason a bureaucratic dogfight that UNAIDS was set up and began functioning in 1986. Um, at the same time, in the same year, we saw the glimmerings of hope when it came to responding to the epidemic because treatment was announced at the Vancouver International AIDS Conference. It involved combining three drugs to hit the uh, virus in three different ways, and it worked. It meant that no longer would people die but it cost $10,000 per patient per year. It was out of reach of the developing world where the number of cases was the, was the highest. And let me just say, I'm nearly finished. So anybody who's getting a bit itchy, uh, twitchy, then I'm nearly, nearly finished. Um, so that was where we were in the middle of the year. Uh, the other thing which I would say is that <coughs> Although it was clearly an African problem, and specifically a Southern African problem, there were places where we needed to look at this pandemic and try and understand what was going on. And we were commissioned to do a, a study of the socioeconomic of impact of AIDS in Ukraine. One of the reasons why I'm so distraught by the war that's going on 
is I so enjoyed working in that country with those incredibly delightful people. And I'd like to think that we contributed to them not having an HIV AIDS epidemic by identifying the people who were most at risk, not only of being infected, but also of having to deal with the consequences. Uh, so that was a, a real privilege. And, and I feel that my career has been incredibly blessed. Although I've been dealing with a really horrible disease, which has affected people's lives extremely seriously, I have been able to um, stretch my intellect in doing this. In 1998, I established the Health Economics and HIV AIDS Research Division at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. In, in 2013, I walked away from it on the grounds that the best gift a find, founder, pioneer, leader can give to an organization that they establish is to go away and let somebody else take it over. And I'm very happy to say that the organization is still there and is still thriving. And it's clear that my leaving was absolutely the right thing to do. So let me finish by just reflecting on the end of my period that I'm covering, which is 2000. In 2000, we had the International AIDS Conference in Durban. And that was the opening of the dark, dark years of President and Becky's denialism. It was horrible. Although ARV prices began to plummet and we were able to start providing um, uh, treatment, we in South Africa faced the denial of our government that HIV existed, that AIDS, HIV caused AIDS, and that AIDS was causing um, massive increases in mortality. So there were three groups of people. There was HIV doesn't exist, and you'll see this denialism with many other diseases. HIV does exist, and it, but it doesn't cause AIDS, and AIDS doesn't exist. It's actually poverty among people. And I'll end off with an anecdote about that. Um, in early 2000, I sat with, uh, sat in my office in England and I had a bit of a gap in my time. And I thought, we've got to say something to turn our country away from the awful course we're going down. And I sent an email to a chap who worked for Anglo-American called Clem Sunter, who'd done some amazing work on scenarios. Some of his work had been incredibly influential in bringing about the end of apartheid. I said to him, Clem, we've got a problem in South Africa. This AIDS epidemic is out of control. The government is denying it. We need to do something. Would you like to write a book with me? And within an hour, he'd been in touch with me. I'm sitting in Norwich, remember? He'd been in touch with me uh, <clears throat> and said, yes, let's. So this is what we wrote. Now, the thing about this, this was January uh, 2000. The AIDS conference was in July 2000. Clem phoned his publishers and said, we're going to write a book for the AIDS conference. It needs to be out by the end of June. How long do you need to publish it? And they looked, they laughed at him and said, we need it by last October. Well, we did it. We got this book out and it sold. It was on the stores of the grocery shelves. And I think it made an awful lot of people think about this pandemic and what we could do about it. Where we end now is, it's a dreadful issue, but it has been a privilege to work on this and think about the big issues. I've had a few ideas, most of them after 2000, so I won't talk about them now, which have been quite earth changing. But I think the big ideas was to understand just how important the social determinants of health are in pandemics. To understand that there are waves of infections, waves of illnesses, and waves of consequences. And to have developed the Jaipur paradigm, which talks about social cohesion and wealth as being two of the critical issues in this pandemic, which allows you to develop a a diagram which has four quadrants where you can place countries and organizations. Okay, that's me. I've talked for far too long, I think. Sorry. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thanks, Alan. <coughs> uh, uh, certainly, I mean, 
you have been a witness in a way to a story, a trajectory uh, in which uh, scholars, activists, I should say AIDS victims have been in a way themselves, the archive, the memory, uh, and they still are as in, as in your case. Uh, I assume there are many questions. We have more or less half an hour uh, for the Q&A. Those who want to intervene, you can you know, just, you know, raise your hand, your virtual hand, your real hand, both your hands, just as you like. So who wants to, to go first? I don't want to, as I often do, abuse my, my position as, as a, a chair. Anyone who wants to uh, jump in? Um, so, um, Alan, I, I do have a couple of questions uh, while waiting for others uh, uh, to jump in. The first one, I mean, your story uh, as an expert, as a scholar, I'm not saying as an activist, but someone, someone who uses scholarship to alert, you know, public opinion, decision makers on something which is not very well known, which you study yourself, which changes over your understanding of that changes alongside with you know what you are trying to do. How has that affected? research, scholarship, the desire I imagine to have a public and political impact, right? I mean, the vast majority of the people here, I assume all of them are historians who do not think in similar terms, who are not social scientists trying to, you know, affect policymaking, decision-making, also even just the public conversation about uh, a given issue. So that's my first uh, question. The second question is on positionality. I mean, you, you are an African dealing with Africa, whereas especially in the eighties, the focus, the attention was primarily on the you know, wealthiest world and especially the US. So much so that at first it was almost an American story, an American virus, and so forth and so on. How did you react to that? And how, I mean, given that, as I say, the, uh, the focus and the attention was primarily on the US. So those are my two questions scholarship and, you know, and I'm not saying militancy, but, you know, the desire to have a public impact and Africa, uh, the story of Africa, especially in the 80s with regard to what was presented and discussed as you know, a rich world, especially US story. Okay, I think the question about uh, the, the desire to be an activist, that, that was way back when. That came from growing up in Swaziland with apartheid just across the border. That came from going to a school. I was incredibly lucky to go there. I was lucky, it wasn't designed, but it was a school where the Mandela children were educated, where the Tutu children were educated, where the Ian Khama from uh, the son of the president of Botswana was educated, where the uh, Suzulu children were. So there, were, there was already a desire inculcated from into me from my earliest school days to try and put things right. And I think nobody can go into academia without having some desire to make the world a better place. Otherwise, I have to ask, why are we doing it? And it doesn't matter whether you're a historian because historians are enormously powerful people as you saw from my quote from George Orwell or whether you're, a, uh, it doesn't matter what you are. You still have the ability to bring about change. You may be able to do it through your writing and we've got these sort of populist uh, people writing. I think of uh, Jared Diamond, Guns, Germs and Steel who is enormously influential on, on my, my work. I think of, uh, so there's, there's a populist historian uh, type of person who's writing, but you also are seeing students and you have impact on your students. You have impact on your colleagues. I don't believe that people have to be uh, activists in a particular way. I think they have to, they become activists because of where they come from, because of seeing injustice and wanting to make change. Um, so that's my positionality. I can't not do things. For me and AIDS, 
it really got very intense when I started losing my staff. And that was the, that's the real problem with a diagram like this, because <clears throat> what you see is here's the problem developing. And if you get there on that HIV curve, you're going to get there on that AIDS curve. So seeing staff dying was, was, was horrible. It really was. Um, and that, and I, I'm going to say here, how do you cope with that? Well, one of the ways you cope with that is you seek help. So very early on in the, ninth, in the 2000s, <clears throat> as we started burying people, I realized I had to go and see a psychologist. I went and gave a talk to a Rotary Club. I don't, do you have Rotary Clubs in uh, Italy? No. Um, it's, uh, it's a group of well-meaning, in those days it was well-meaning, uh, male, usually white. Gave a talk to the Rotary Club, and as I talked about people dying, it began to strike me that these were people I knew. And I left the uh, meeting and I went and sat in my car and I cried my eyes out for half an hour. And then I thought, I can't do this. I'm not a medic. I don't have the perspective. I'm going to see a psychologist. And that was the best decision I ever made. <clears throat> so I do think we need to interrogate our positionality and make sure that our mental health is taken care of. And by the way, I'll say to all of you, very seriously now, that's something you especially need to do in this time of COVID. People are looking up to us as academics, as leaders, as thinkers, and we're not necessarily very well equipped to do this. So please take care of your mental health. Please do it. It's something you have to do. Um, so anger, I think was the other thing. And then the last question which you asked, and this is again, I think terribly, terribly important, is when you do something, you have to get it out there. If it's something that's worth doing, you have to get it out there. And DFID, I worked for DFID for a while, had a program called GRIP, <clears throat> Getting Research into Policy and Practice. So, you know, we've got three ways in which we communicate. One is books, something like that. It's nice to have, who's gonna read it? Well, it, as it happens, I know that um, Bill Gates read this because in, uh, in an interview he did, he said, and I just read this book, AIDS and Globalization by Tony Barnett. I thought, well, thanks, Tony. What about me? Because <laughs> we co-authored it. So that's the way to do it. Really good quality uh, books, journals, peer reviewed, make them readable. Please make them readable. There's nothing worse than something that's not readable. The second thing is um, more popular articles and, and, and briefs. And if you've got something to say, and that's this. This was, was amazing. You, thank you very much for, for complimenting me on this. When I sat down to write this, um, I struggled. God, I struggled. And the thing that broke the logjam, because it's an introduction to HIV AIDS, it's a very short introduction. It's that big, and it's supposed to introduce all of HIV and AIDS. And the editor at Oxford University Press said, you're battling, let me tell you the secret. It's 37 and a half thousand words. It's your introduction. It's what you think people need to, to know about this. So popular writing is also extremely good. Whether you write an op-ed for the, the press or whatever, that's, that's, a, that's a way to get out there. Blogs are quite important, I think, nowadays, uh, writing blogs. The challenge is to get them read. But it is important to get research into policy and uh, practice. That's really something I think is, is terribly important. So academic, popular, and then public. And that's the way we need to go. And giving talks, that's another good way of, of doing it. But I think that's one of the, 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 the things that we as academics have to undertake is to communicate with people and to make things change if we can. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's, you know, when, when Marco, <coughs> Ilari and I, we began, you know, discussing the possibility to, 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 to cooperate and to work together on, on this project, it, it's striking in such, you know, highly contemporary history, how autobiographic it can easily become. Uh, you know, I grew up in a small town up in Italian Dolomites, a very small town, and I, I lost two friends, well, one friend and one person I knew because of AIDS, you know, a guy who used to play football with me. Uh, and uh, so we have, we all share those, you know, kind of stories. 
with my which my younger PhD students, some of them are here, are less familiar possibly with because they grew up when a cure had been finally found uh, and when AIDS uh, was not anymore uh, 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 inexorably uh, fatal uh, disease. So uh, let me see if there are other questions and comments. There was a follow-up, uh, Alan, on uh, being an, studying Africa in a period in which AIDS was mostly about the US, or at least yes, in, yes, in, yes, in yes, the well, public. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's absolutely right. It was a, a battle, but I think the time you asked me to cover, uh, it was uh, very much a, uh, a, a US thing, um, and it was a battle. We had to get it out there. Uh, we were helped, and uh, I got to come back to COVID, I mean, which is something we're all battling with. Now, I'd like to ask your students a question. They're not going to ask me questions. Uh, I think uh, I can ask them a question if you'll allow that uh, in a minute or two. And you can pick on the student we, we're going to ask to talk about this. Um, but I think, you know, when you, when you, the other thing is we recognize that things go in waves. There are times when something will be popular and with HIV, yeah, it's not high on the agenda anymore. But let me ask the students and you can work out which one you want to answer this. How does this compare to COVID? Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know who, I, I need a volunteer, uh, at least among those who have the camera on and <laughs> I can look straight into your eyes. Uh, uh, so anyone who wants to, to respond, how would you compare? Actually, some of you have, uh, you know, I, I, in my global history course, uh, I have a class on AIDS and HIV. Uh, and and my TAs, they do the tutorial session with the readings, including a couple of chapters from your short history. So I don't know if anyone wants to uh, uh, jump in on, on that, uh, because I assume in the tutorial discussion, the comparison between uh, HIV and COVID came up. Well, I'm I look, see I'm look, I'm look, I'm Evan has taken his mute off, so why okay. don't we go to Evan? Okay. Well, I was just gonna say, in terms of in terms of what, in terms of uh, what are we comparing here between COVID and HIV? In terms of infection rate, in terms of the fear that's been created about it. What do you think the the, the there are? Where do you think there are parallels? Give me a second, and I'll get back to you. All right. All right. <laughs> No, but we will come back to you, Evan. I mean, you've been brave enough to <laughs> hand up, and I'm very grateful for that. Andrew, go ahead. I'm actually going to uh, cheat here and not answer your question, uh, and instead actually ask a related question that I had throughout your talk. And that's, um, you know, you, you published the, the very short introduction on AIDS and HIV, as well as several other books. Um, but the very short introduction is also, um, with, with all the respect, a, a bit dated now, like uh, uh, the most recent edition, I think is from 2016. And obviously um, we're in the midst of another pandemic. And I'm wondering how this, the, the experience of living through this subsequent pandemic has uh, changed your understanding of the early years of the uh, HIV pandemic in Southern Africa, if it has at all, or if, if there's sort of insights from the past two years or so that have changed how you understood those years. So what I think, and I'd really like somebody else to comment on this, what I think uh, HIV in Southern Africa taught us is that life has a finite value. Everybody's life has a finite value, a, a monetary value. And there comes a point when that life can't be prolonged. What COVID suggests to me is that we've lost sight of how to uh, value life and where to value life. I mean, for God's sake, youngsters in, in this world at the moment who've spent two years locked down, for what? To protect the lives of a relatively few elderly people. Was this the right decision? I don't think so. But then I'm not an elderly person, so I might have a different view on that and 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 uh, Mario, I you talked about growing up at the Dolomites and, and uh, losing people to HIV/AIDS. What about the COVID pandemic, which, let's face it, was 
uh, located in that part of Italy, um, did we respond in the right way? I don't think so. And I think that's the one thing which HIV has taught me. And Mario, you need to say something. Um, since you, you know, I just, I have my own opinion, which is slightly different from, from yours, uh, uh, but possibly because <laughs> I'm aging myself and I, I know more and more, you know, uh, 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 aged uh, uh, people and again a few I knew uh, died uh, because of COVID uh, so clearly there is an intergenerational solidarity here which is something new it is something new uh, which is linked possibly to to how we relate uh, to to life uh, and to death uh, uh, possibly that said um questions um uh, on on Alan's um, presentation and the story uh, he told us about, you know, growing up, uh, growing up, becoming an AIDS uh, scholar uh, during the pandemic. Yes, uh, Antonio. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the autoethnography that is very intriguing in seeing some of the dynamics behind the scene. And uh, um, I found uh, there is a, a, um, something that relates to COVID. You mentioned the politicization of an illness that led to pressure on the measurement. And you gave us an example of, 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 of how the need for politician, public opinion and scholars to make sense of something that wasn't impossible to understand because it was unique at the time, put pressure on forcing uh, the scholars and the research to cut corner or to find solution. I would like to, if you can expand more on the politicization of an illness and the impact on scholar and research. Mm. That's, a, that's a good question. That's an interesting question. Um, well, I think there are two sorts of research, uh, which one of which is, is fairly straightforward, although my uh, medical friends would probably kill me for saying this, and that is the need to gain scientific knowledge as quickly as possible to understand the illness and how to respond to it. And that happened very, very quickly uh, with HIV and AIDS, where we identified the virus, where we had um, treatments available by 1996. And by 2002, those treatments were affordable around the world. So there is the scientific um, part of it. And we've seen that as well with COVID. Uh, the Chinese, uh, whether or not they meant to, released the, uh, the, 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 the DNA of, of the, or the cellular structure, whatever it was, of the virus by the 12th of January. And that enabled scientists to work incredibly quickly in developing uh, a response to COVID. Um, and that we've seen not just with uh, vaccines, which are amazing, they do work, they do have side effects. I can put my hand up and say that because I spent a night sweating after having Pfizer as my booster shot for the third shot, um, but they work. The vaccines are amazing, but we've also got, and we don't get this, as much. We've also got a number of very effective drugs which can be used as treatment for COVID. So that's the science. The social science is, is uh, very fascinating um, because, and I think this is why, uh, Maria, I have to say, I, I'm going to come back to this. That's why I, the social science is about valuing. It's more about valuing economics and social science. And that discourse, I think, has not gone properly with regard to COVID. Um, so social science uh, is really important. And then of course the last area, I mean, here we are. If you haven't seen this book, uh, let me see if I can pick it up very quickly. Here we go. This is probably one of the most influential books for me that I've ever come across. It's Jerome Kagan. It's called The Three Cultures, and it's natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities in the 21st century. Fascinating book. It builds on the work of C.P. Snow, who talked about two cultures. I'm sorry, guys. I know you're into the arts, but 
Jerome Kagan doesn't really do justice to the arts. It's uh, 246 pages, uh, the humanities, it, the book is 246 pages and uh, only uh, 40 pages of the humanities. So you need to read this and write the next section, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it is, it is a, I'm, I'm digressing and I, I think I'm probably not answering your question. Uh, I think it comes back to, I'm sorry, you, maybe you need to repeat the question. I'll just end up by saying, uh, before you repeat, because I haven't answered it, it comes back to responsibility and making a change. Sorry, can I ask you to repeat what you were saying? No, you, you answered, because my, my question was how the politicization of uh, an, an illness can impact the role, the social role of science. And you answered, uh, gave us, and to me, it's consistent your answer with what you say, the difference between West and Africa, when one answer is epidemiological and the other is public health. So uh, the situation nature of the answer to the politicization of illness is uh, coming across from your autoethnography. So no, thank you very much. Thank you. Evan. So I know I was put on the spot earlier, but so I'm coming back um, because actually I was just thinking about um, some of your responses that you gave before, and in particular about the response that was given between AIDS and between COVID. And I have a personal question for you. And that is when was AIDS, when was it understood or that HIV is spread through having, un through having unprotected or dangerous sex? Was that something that was understood immediately? And the reason why I asked this question is because the response to the treatment or the, um, trans uh, the transmissibility of, of AIDS and HIV, there was a response which was wear condoms or condomization, as, as you said. Just like uh, there was a response with COVID saying wear masks. Um, so there was a type of you know, preventative measure or at least some sort of response uh, response given in that respect. But the reason why I ask this is because my background is actually in history of science and history of medicine. And one um, really important way of looking at the history of medicine in particular is understanding the cultural construct of a disease. How do people make sense of a disease once it's affecting them in particular? Um, and I'm just curious about your own experience with that, um, given that you've, you've worked across several different countries um, and I was particularly interested in the workers who are being infected with HIV or also the mothers who are infected with HIV. How, are they, how did they make sense of the disease? Um, so I guess there are really two sets of questions. When was it understood that HIV AIDS was transmitted through, or it was easily transmitted through having unprotected sex? And then secondly was how did different cultures or different societies understand the disease um, given your own experience? They're both really good questions. I think the first one is easy to answer because there is a, a factual answer there. Uh, the second one is, is, a, is a much more complicated one. So when was it understood? I would say by about 1983. So the virus was discovered, the virus was identified, the transmission mechanisms <coughs> were identified fairly soon afterwards, mainly by observation. So the hemophilics, we understood that there was blood involved in this. So basically we then knew a blood-borne disease would be transmitted if um, unsafe blood was uh, given to somebody else. And that was uh, very, and then from that, it was a very easy step to understand that intravenous drug users who shared their equipment were going to uh, enable cross contamination. The uh, sexual transmission of HIV, which is the primary uh, driver um, for. Uh, we understood that fairly soon on, and that was partly because of uh, the way it spread among the gay community, um, which was just basically about uh, having sex, uh, unprotected sex. There were early on attempts to look at some other causes, and a particular drug, recreational drug called poppers, was thought briefly to be in, in, involved in this. Um, and then we started seeing the children of infected mothers uh, being infected with HIV. And that led us to understand that there was a transmission from mother to child in vitro in the womb during the birth process and terribly tragically uh, 
possibly even through infect through breast milk. And so that led to very simple interventions to prevent mother to child transmission, which happened very quickly in, in the pandemic. I'd say that by 1985, we knew the main uh, routes of transmission. They varied in proportion, depending on which society you were in. So in Thailand, it was the brothels, it was heterosexual transmission. In the bathhouses of New York and Los Angeles, it was sexual, it was gay sex, which was causing transmission. In Scotland, for example, it was uh, intravenous drug users. In Ukraine, it was intravenous drug users and their partners. In Africa, on the other hand, it is primarily a heterosexually transmitted disease and women are more likely to be infected than men because of the nature of the sex act, um, which involves, um, uh, I mean, obviously it's transmitted through the seminal fluid of men into the women. And obviously if you're having sex and you're the receptive partner, then the uh, contaminated, the, the potential is greater. And also there's more likely to be abrasions or tearing for women than there is for men. Which brings us very neatly to a really important question, which is um, <coughs> around uh, gender-based violence. And that is a major driver of the pandemic in some parts of Africa. Um, so that was the first part of your question. The second part, repeat for me. Yeah, no problem. It's about the cultural construction of how the disease was itself understood among different countries where you have worked. I think to give you a good answer to that, I would need to be far more reflective as an individual than I am. I think uh, Mario introduced me as an economist and economists are the people who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. So, but let me give it a stab. Of course, we saw um, people uh, trying to blame others. The, there was a huge amount of othering with this, with the HIV pandemic, uh, identifying others as, as the uh, source. And, and I, I mean, as a, I, you probably read anthropology, um, there's a wonderful story of Max Gluckman who, was doing work in Zambia and uh, one of his field assistants said, I've got malaria, I've been bewitched. And Gluckman spent some time explaining to the field assistant that no, it's a malaria parasite, which has been transferred to you by a mosquito that has bitten you. And at the end of it, he says, you're right, you understand this now, there's no witchcraft involved. And the research assistant says, no, there is. Why did that mosquito bite me? And uh, so how you construct things is really interesting. I think there was in South Africa early on in the pandemic, a lot of uh, blame, a lot of othering, a lot of misinformation. Uh, there was at one stage a belief uh, we, which was reported how widely it was practiced, I don't know, but it must've been practiced a few times that in order to be um, cleared of HIV, you should have rape, effectively, a, a virgin, and that would mean that you would be um, uh, relieved of this. I, 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 it's fascinating, this whole area. Again, I, I, I think back to my time working in India, where you had uh, people driving, and this was an HIV prevention issue. A lot of the drivers traveling around India would for long times, for long periods with, with, uh, on long journeys would have a, a young man or a boy working in the cab with them and acting as a companion. And those men would be, those youngsters would be abused. The logic of that, according to my Indian friends was that they had to get rid of the excess um, heat, which came from being in the cab all the time. And one way was to ejaculate. So there are all sorts of things and that's a very, poor answer to your question, and I see Ilario has his hand up, which allows me to duck out. Ilaria. Thank you. Well, I, I was just wondering if, you're, if you, in your long experience, have had a relationship with Italian authorities, institutions, or experts 
Yes, indeed. Um, there was, uh, I was on the International Aid Society governing council for 12 years. And there were a number of people uh, from uh, Rome and from Italian institutions that we worked with on that. I also had the joy of having uh, uh, a young Italian work for me called, also called Ilaria, who came to me uh, through ODI. So I have had some contact, not perhaps as much as I would like. I worked with the Innocenti Children's Center in Florence, uh, which is the UNICEF Center in, in Florence, but not as much as I would like. So I'm open to offers. Thank you. Thanks. So time is running short. Uh, we must end by seven. There is time for a last quick question and even quicker <laughs> reply. Uh, um, I do have one for you, Alan, too, and it's about the denialism of um, Becky and the likes you briefly hinted at uh, during your presentation. Uh, what did you make of it and how did you cope with it <laughs> and how did you explain it? It was very, very hard um, because Mbeki was going against all the science that there was and he was infecting the population against their better. He was infecting them with his denialism against their better interest. So as an academic and as a citizen of South Africa, uh, it was very, very difficult. And to be honest, I haven't forgiven the man for it yet because people died as a result of that. Um, we couldn't cope with it really. We just uh, had to carry on as best we could uh, and try and say that this is not the way it is. And that was that was really the only option we had. Um, let me let me say the last thing I'll I'll say because I do want to circle back to this is the people on this call. We're incredibly fortunate. We're academics. We have the ability and the time to think, but it also means we have great responsibility. And I do want to stress to all of you that we have a huge responsibility as academics, as leaders, as exemplars especially in this terribly troubled time with COVID, with conflict and all the rest that's going on. And, and I think we do need to, each of us make a commitment to do the best we can for ourselves, for our colleagues and for our students. Okay, with this plea, uh, uh, thank you so much, Alan. We, we can, I think, end here. So I just ask you, the other participants, to uh, join me in giving you a virtual <laughs> round of applause uh, as, we, as we do uh, uh, usually in these occasions. Now, uh, this was the last uh, uh, seminar of this first series we, we organized from, you know, was the, the first one was in February, I think. Uh, uh, we hope you will be back <laughs> in the fall uh, uh, to be discussed. But thanks so much to, uh, to you, Alan, for accepting our invitation and being with us uh, uh, today and to all the people who has uh, participated uh, to the seminars. And if I may say this to Ilaria and Marco, who first launched the idea and, uh, and the initiative uh, taking me uh, on board. Uh, Thank you it's to a, you, Mario. And it's a beautiful night here in Rome. There is some uh, pasta carbonara uh, waiting for me uh, uh, at the restaurant. So thank you all. And I hope to uh, see you again uh, soon, hopefully, hopefully in person, since that we are now finally back to in-person events. Thanks again, Alan. Uh, have a, a pleasure. Great... Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. Bye. Eh...